The House will be in order. The members will take their conversations out of the back of the room. For what purpose does the gentleman from California seek recognition? The House will come to order. Mr. Speaker, pursuant to House Resolution 493, I call up the conference report on the bill, H.R. 1540, and ask for its immediate consideration. The clerk will report the title of the bill. H.R. 1540, an act to authorize appropriations for fiscal year 2012 for military activities of the Department of Defense for military construction and for defense activities of the Department of Energy to prescribe military personnel strengths for such fiscal year and for other purposes. The House will be in order. Pursuant to House Resolution 493, the conference report is considered read. The gentleman from California, Mr. McKeon, and the gentleman from Washington, Mr. Smith, will each control 30 minutes. Mr. Speaker. What purpose does the gentleman from New York rise? Mr. Speaker, is the gentleman from Washington opposed to the conference report? No, I am not. I am supportive of the conference and report. Mr. Speaker, uh, I claim the time in opposition to the conference report. Pursuant to Clause 8 of Rule 22, the gentleman from California, Mr. McKeon, the gentleman from Washington, Mr. Smith, and the gentleman from New York, Mr. Nadler, will each control 20 minutes. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from California, Mr. McKeon. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent that all members may have five legislative days in which to revise and extend the remarks on the conference report to accompany H.R. 1540. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I yield myself such time as I may consume. The gentleman yields himself as much time as he might consume. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today in support of fiscal year 2012 National Defense Authorization Act conference report. As you know, the NDAA is the key mechanism by which the Congress fulfills its primary constitutional responsibility to provide for the common defense, and this year will mark the 50th consecutive year we've completed our work. The NDAA passed the Armed Services Committee with a vote of 60 to 1. It passed the full House by a wide margin of 322 to 96. Likewise, the Senate adopted this version of the bill by a vote of 93 to 7. We negotiated every provision in the two bills and have delivered this conference report using regular order. This is a bipartisan product from start to finish with a wide base of support. Let me further assure members that the bill's authorization levels have been reduced to comply with the Budget Control Act. The, the bill would bring the total authorized funding for the national defense to $554 billion for the base budget and $115.5 billion for overseas contingency operations. This represents a $19 billion reduction from last year's authorization. Nonetheless, what makes our bill such an important piece of legislation are the vital authorities contained therein. Our bill provides for pay and benefits for our military and their families, as well as the authorities that they need to continue prosecuting the war on terrorism. In addition, we include landmark pieces of leg legislation sanctioning the Central Bank of Iran and strengthening policies and procedures used to detain, interrogate, and prosecute al-Qaeda, the Taliban, and affiliated groups and those who substantially support them. However, I must be crystal clear on this point. The provisions do not extend any new authorities to detain U.S. citizens and explicitly exempt U.S. citizens from provisions related to military custody of terrorists. The conference report covers many more critical issues, but I'll close in the interest of time. However, before I do, I'd like to thank my partner, the ranking member from, Mich from Michigan, from uh, Washington, 
Adam Smith, the ranking member on the committee, and I reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman reserves the balance of his time. For what purpose does the gentleman from Washington seek recognition? Uh, I yield myself uh, three minutes. The gentleman is recognized for uh, three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I, too, want to thank the chairman, Mr. McKeon. Uh, we always say that our committee is the most bipartisan committee in Congress. We strongly believe that. Republicans and Democrats on that committee are committed to doing our job, uh, which is to provide the troops and uh, make sure that our national security is protected in this country. Uh, Mr. McKeon was an excellent partner to work with. It, it's a model for what happens when you sit down and try to legislate together in something that I think uh, could be emulated by many more committees and on many more issues. So thank you, Buck. It's been great working with you on this. I think we've produced a good product. I want to up front address the issue that most people have focused on in the rule and elsewhere, and that is the issue surrounding detainee policy. I have never seen an issue that was more distorted in terms of what people have said is in the bill versus what is actually in the bill. Number one, habeas corpus is protected, not touched in this bill. Pursuant to court rulings, anyone picked up pursuant to this has pursuant to the authorization for the use of military force, has habeas corpus rights that is not touched categorically. Now, I understand that a lot of people have a problem with what is current law. Mr. Speaker, the House is not in order. Forgive me. The gentleman is right. The House is not in order. The House will come to order. The gentleman may proceed. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And current law is something we've been debating ever since 9-11. Uh, both the Bush administration and the Obama administration have taken the position that indefinite detention is an option. In two cases before the Supreme Court, the Hamdi case most notably, a U.S. citizen was briefly subject to uh, indefinite, determina or, sorry, indefinite detention. The court, Fourth Circuit, upheld that right. That is current law. And I actually share some of the concerns amongst my colleagues about that current law. But this bill doesn't affect that. We, in fact, make it clear in our category on military detention that it is not meant to apply to U.S. citizens or lawful resident aliens. Read the bill. It is in there. Nothing in this section shall apply to U.S. citizens or lawful resident aliens. Now, if you have a problem with indefinite detention, that is a problem with current law. Defeating this bill will not change that, won't change it at all. But I'll tell you what it will do. It will undermine the ability of our troops to do their job, to do what we've asked them to do. If we defeat this bill, we defeat a pay raise for the troops, we defeat MILCON projects for the troops, we defeat endless support programs that are absolutely vital to them doing their jobs. And I don't think I need to remind this body that 100,000 of those troops are in harm's way in Afghanistan right now, facing a determined enemy in the middle of a fight. It is not the time to cut off their support over an issue that isn't going to be fixed by this bill. And let me emphasize that just one more time. Current law, as interpreted by the Bush administration, the Obama administration, and the judiciary of this country, creates the problems that everybody's talking about not this bill. We put language in on detention policy because we think it's about time the legislative branch at least said something on the subject. But we are not the ones to create that problem. I urge support for this bill. I yield myself an additional 30 seconds, if I may. Um, additional 30 seconds. One issue I want to address is the issue of military construction projects for Guam. There is some limiting language in this bill on that issue based on the fact that the Department of Defense is rethinking their posture in Asia uh, between Okinawa and Guam and other places. But one thing I want to make clear, Guam is a critically important part of our Asia presence. They have presence of our military there now. Language in this bill is not meant to cut off existing military construction projects or indeed other ones that may not be related to this. And I want to make sure that that's clear. And with that, I reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman's time has expired. The gentleman reserves the balance of his time. What purpose does the gentleman from New York seek recognition? Mr. Speaker, I re rise in opposition to the conference report and I yield myself five minutes. The gentleman yields himself five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's been a decade since the attacks of September 11, 2001. We are in danger of losing our most precious heritage, not because a band of thugs threatens our freedom, but because we are at risk of forgetting who we are and what makes the United States a truly great nation. In the last 10 years, we have begun to let go of our freedoms, bit by bit, 
with each new executive order, court decision, and yes, act of Congress. The changes in this bill to the laws of detention have major implications for our fundamental rights. We should not be considering this as a rider to the Defense of Authorization Bill. This should have been the subject of close scrutiny by the Judiciary Committee. The complex legal and constitutional issues should have been properly analyzed and the implications for our values carefully considered. You will hear that this bill merely recodifies existing law, but many legal scholars tell us it goes a great deal further than what the law now allows, that it codifies claims of executive power against our liberties that the courts have never confirmed. You will hear that it really won't affect U.S. citizens, although, again, there is credible legal authority that tells us just the opposite. You will hear that it doesn't really turn the military into a domestic police force, but that clearly isn't the case. Most of all, you will hear that we must do this to be safe when the opposite is true. We can never be safe without our liberties, and this bill continues the decade-long campaign to destroy those liberties. This bill goes far beyond the authorization for the use of military force. That resolution authorized all necessary and appropriate force against those nations, organizations, or persons the President determines planned, authorized, committed, or aided the terrorist attacks that occurred on September 11, 2001, or harbored such organizations or persons. This bill is not limited to those responsible for the September 11 attacks and those who aided or harbored them. It includes anyone who, quote, substantially supported al-Qaeda and the Taliban, or, quote, associated forces that are engaged in hostilities against the United States or its coalition partners, unquote. It is not clear what is meant by substantially supported or what it takes to be associated with someone who substantially supported them. It refers to any belligerent act or to someone who has, quote, directly supported such hostilities in aid of such enemy forces. It doesn't, as does our criminal law, say material support, so we really don't know whether that support could be merely a speech or an article or something else. So let's not pretend that this is just the same as the AUMF. If it were, there would be no need to pass this law. We have it already. Courts and reading legislation operate on the very sensible assumption that Congress doesn't write surplus language, that it must have intended to do something. Here it is pretty clear that we are expanding the reach of the AUMF beyond the 9-11 perpetrators and those who aided and harbored them. Whoever it reaches, and we don't know, but whoever it reaches, the government would have the authority to lock them up without trial until, quote, the end of hostilities, unquote, which given how broadly the AUMF has been used to justify actions far from Afghanistan might mean forever. And who will be taken out of the civilian justice system and imprisoned forever without a trial? The bill says anyone who, quote, is determined, unquote, to be covered by the statute. It doesn't say determined by whom or what protections there are to ensure that an innocent person doesn't disappear into a military prison. That's not America. We also need to be clear that the so-called Feinstein Amendment does not really provide the protection its sponsor intended to provide. The Feinstein Amendment says that, quote, nothing in this section shall be construed to affect existing law or authorities relating to the detention of United States citizens, lawful resident aliens in the United States, or any other persons who are captured or arrested in the United States, close quote. So what are existing law and authorities? As former FBI Director William Sessions has recently written, the provision does not limit such detention authority to pe people captured in the battlefield. The reality is that current law and the scope of such executive authority is unsettled. Director Sessions goes on to point out that in the two cases where the Supreme Court might have decided the question of detaining a U.S. citizen or a legal permanent resident, the U.S. claimed that the President had the authority, the administration claimed the President had the authority to detain a suspected terrorist captured within the United States indefinitely without charge or trial. In both these cases, Padilla and Dalmari, the government changed course and decided to try them in civilian courts in order to avoid a Supreme Court ruling on that question, and that question remains undetermined. So when the Feinstein Amendment references existing law, you should not assume that means the current law clearly deprives the President of this dangerous power. I hope it does, but it is still legally an open question. We should ensure that our liberty is protected and not leave that question to some future court. And we should certainly not enact a law codifying and that's what this law does. It codifies, it puts into law terrifying claims of power made by presidents, but never approved by the courts or until now by the Congress. And that's the fundamental reason we should reject this bill. We must take great care. Our liberties are too precious to be cast aside in times of peril and fear. We have the tools to deal with those who would attack us. We do, I'll yield myself 30 seconds. The gentleman yields himself an additional 30 seconds. We do not need to do this. We should not do this. 
and because of this momentous challenge to one of the founding principles of the United States, that no person may be deprived of his liberty without due process of law, this bill must be rejected. I reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman reserves the balance of his time. For what purpose does the gentleman from California seek recognition? Mr. Speaker, I yield two minutes to my friend and colleague, the gentleman from Texas, Vice Chairman of the Committee, the uh, Chairman of the Subcommittee on Emerging Threats and Capabilities, and member of the Congress of the Conference Committee, Mr. Thornberry. The gentleman yields to the gentleman from Texas two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Speaker, and, and uh, I rise in support of this conference report, and it is a broad-ranging conference report that affects everything from personnel policies to weapon systems to research and development uh, across the Department of Defense and the military. And I especially commend Chairman McKeon, Ranking Member Smith, and all the staff who have worked since all year to make this possible, but it worked especially hard in the last few days to, to make this conference report possible uh, before the Congress adjourns. There are a number of good, important provisions in this bill that strengthen our country's national security. But in, in light of, of the, the, the comments we have recently heard, Mr. Speaker, let me talk just a moment about this issue of detention. You know, one can put into law, the sun comes up, and if somebody comes and says, no, it doesn't, you can present all the evidence and you can present words that have clear meaning, and if somebody just wants to say, no, it doesn't, you know, you, you, it, it, at some level, reach an impasse. The two provisions related to detention in this bill, the words have been put into the law are very clear. One says, it does not apply to U.S. citizens. It does not. Nothing here affects U.S. citizens. The other provision says that nothing in this section can be construed to affect existing law or authorities related to the detention of U.S. citizens. Now, it seems to me there may well be people who are uncomfortable with the current law, and I understand that. And the proper thing to do is to introduce a bill and try to get that amended in some way uh, to get it more uh, to your liking. But to argue that this bill changes in some way the current law when the words say nothing in this section shall be construed to, to affect existing law authorities is, is, is just not credible. I, this, is, this is a small step. The provisions in this, in this bill, Mr. Speaker, are a small step towards having this Congress back involved in making these detention, detention decisions. I think it is the right small step, gentleman's and it should be supported. For what purpose is the gentleman from Washington State seek recognition? I yield two minutes to the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Andrews, uh, a very important member of the Armed Services Committee. The gentleman from New Jersey is recognized for two minutes. Seeing the objection, it's ordered. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise with profound respect for our Constitution and for my colleagues and friends who care deeply about the impact of this bill on that Constitution. It is because I have considered those issues that I would respectfully disagree with some of my colleagues and argue for the propriety and constitutionality of this bill. I would deplore the idea that an American citizen or a permanent resident alien could be rounded up and put in a prison in the United States of America. This bill does not authorize that scenario. I would deplore a circumstance where any person, even a person who is not here under some permanent legal status, could be rounded up and put in a prison and only a military prison. That is not what this bill authorizes. It leaves open the option that such a person could be detained in a regular civilian prison or in a military provision. I would reject completely the proposition that any person could be held in any facility, military or civilian, anywhere in our country indefinitely without the right to have the charges uh, that are levied against them heard by some neutral finder of fact. It is our interpretation that the habeas corpus provisions already extend to these individuals. That is to say that a non-resident or non-legal person in the country who is held under such circumstances in fact has the right of habeas corpus. I think the law requires it. I think the Constitution demands it. 
There is a legitimate difference of opinion as to whether or not that conclusion is correct. That is the state of present law. This bill does not amend present law in a way that I would like to see it amended by clarifying that right of habeas corpus, but it absolutely does not erode or reduce whatever protections exist under existing law. So those who would share our view that the right of habeas must be clarified should work together to pass a statute that does just that. But we should not subvert this necessary and important bill. I would urge a yes vote on the bill. Gentleman's time yield back expired. my time. Gentleman from New York. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I now yield uh, the distinguished uh, ranking uh, member of the Judiciary Committee, the gentleman from Michigan, uh, three minutes. The gentleman from Michigan is recognized for three minutes. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, members of the House of Representatives, this issue has never gone before the House Judiciary Committee. Never. And I would like to put in the record a letter from the former director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, William Sessions, and it's dated December 14th, and it says, there has been some debate over whether Section 1021 of the National Defense Act Authority merely restates existing law or would for the first time codify authority for the president to indefinitely detain without charge virtually anyone picked up in anti-terrorism efforts, including United States citizens arrested on United States soil. Attached, please find a letter from Judge William Sessions, a former federal judge and former director of the FBI under Presidents Reagan, Bush, and Clinton, explaining that current law on this point is unclear and that enacting Section 1021 of this act would dangerously expand the power for indefinite detention. I know you gentlemen have studied this in the Armed Services Committee, but I've got a letter from the former head of the FBI and Judge William Sessions and another letter from 23 generals and admirals saying the same thing. Would, I know you're very learned people and very conscientious, but please, when the heads of the FBI, Republicans, judges all tell you that you're doing the wrong thing, what does it take for us to vote this down? Because this provision allows for the first time we codify a, a court decision that will now make it okay to lock up U.S. citizens for terrorism. Uh, this is what it says, Mr. Chairman. Can't you... Well, I'll read it again. There has been some debate, and, he's, and he says... Education. That's what that would person's... You, would I'm you sorry. let me uh, re be recognize you on your own time? I've only got three minutes. Oh, it's okay then. All right. Gentleman's time has expired. Gentleman from California. This time, uh, Mr. Speaker, I yield two minutes. My friend and colleague, the gentleman from Maryland, the chairman of the subcommittee on tactical air and land forces, and member of the conference committee, Mr. Bartlett. The gentleman yields two minutes to the gentleman from Maryland. Thank you. I rise in support of the conference report for the National Defense Authorization Act for fiscal year 2012. This is the 50th consecutive conference report for the National Defense Authorization Act. 
I have the honor of serving as the chairman of the Tactical Air and Land Forces Subcommittee of our Armed Services Committee. Under the full committee leadership of Chairman McKeon and Ranking Member Smith, the support of Sylvester Reyes, our subcommittee's ranking member, and a superb staff. Ours is truly a bipartisan effort. Consideration of this conference report comes at a critical period for our nation and our military. World events and the nation's fiscal circumstances have challenged our government's will and capacity to constructively address the enormity of the challenges we face. We need to develop a new national military strategy that better reflects the current and projected threat and fiscal environment. This is needed to facilitate full and balanced consideration of force structure and equipment and investment plans and programs. Our first priority and immediate requirement is to fully support our personnel serving overseas in Afghanistan and the many other countries where we have asked them to serve under the daily constant threat to their personal survival. This constant conference report properly reflects this immediate requirement. The National Defense Authorization Act conference report authorizes an additional $325 million for National Guard and Reserve Equipment unfunded requirements. $3 billion is provided to support urgent operational needs and, counter and to counter improvised explosive device activities. $2.7 billion is provided to support mine-resistant ambush protected vehicle modernization and survivability enhancements. And $2.4 billion is provided for Army and Marine Corps tactical wheeled vehicles, including $155 million for development of the Joint Light Tactical Vehicle. To meet projected future needs, an additional $255 million is provided to support the Abrams Tank Industrial Base and National Guard Tank Modernization, increasing the request from 21 to 70 tank upgrades, avoiding a production break in the tank upgrade program. $8.5 billion is provided for F-35 multi-service aircraft. $3.2 billion is provided for 40 aircraft and two models of F-18 aircraft. $2.4 billion is provided for V-22 Ospreys for the Marine Corps and the Air Force. And multi-year procurement Gentlemen's is authorized for various models of Army and Navy H-60 helicopters. I urge all of my colleagues to support this conference report. Thank you. Gentleman from New York, Washington. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. At this time, I yield two minutes to the gentleman from Texas, the uh, ranking member on the Air Land Subcommittee, Mr. Reyes. The gentleman is recognized for two minutes. Th thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the gentleman for yielding me time. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I rise today in support of the Fiscal Year 2012 National Defense Authorization Act. This bill represents months of hard work by members on both sides uh, of the aisle, and I especially wanted to thank my friend... Uh, uh, and Chairman uh, Mr. McKeon and Ranking Member Smith, as well as uh, my Chairman Roscoe Bartlett uh, for the inclusive uh, uh, work that was done uh, in this legislation. It is important to note that what this bill does not include, uh, during conference negotiations, unnecessary provisions limiting the work of military chaplains were dropped. Now the bill will allow the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell to proceed so that troops who defend our values will have protections that they have fought to defend. Working with the White House, our committee achieved a final compromise on detainees that does not grant broad new authority for the detention of U.S. citizens and does not establish a new authority for indefinite detention of, of terrorists. The bill strikes a reasonable balance between protecting our nation from terrorists like those who attacked our nation on September the 11th and protecting our American values. It demonstrates that we do not need to sacrifice our civil liberties to be safe. Finally, I urge members to support this legislation because it also includes a pay raise for our troops and provides funds for the care needed to recover from the wounds of war. The bill improves access to mental health care for members of the National Guard and Reserves, and, and the bill also expands and improves laws dealing with sexual assault and harassment. Uh, I ask all members to uh, vote for this very important piece of legislation, uh, and I yield back the balance of my time. He yields back the balance of his time. The gentleman from New York. Uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, I now yield to the gentleman from Georgia, uh, four minutes. Gentleman from Georgia is recognized for four minutes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. 
Uh, Mr. Speaker, I have a unique position in Congress in that I serve both on the House Armed Services Committee and the House Judiciary Committee. The House Armed Services Committee is charged with the responsibility of protecting the security of America from external threats. The Judiciary Committee is charged with the awesome responsibility of protecting uh, the rights of Americans uh, to live freely and protecting that from internal threats. I know that uh, my service on armed services has, uh, has been good uh, and I appreciate the bipartisanship with which uh, our chairman and the ranking member uh, address the issues uh, for keeping America safe from external threats. And, uh, and I must commend you for uh, very difficult times in reaching this particular product. Uh, however, I rise in opposition to uh, this uh, defense authorization bill uh, reached in conference committee because it does uh, uh, disturb the rights that Americans have uh, come to enjoy uh, under our Constitution. We have, sworn in, uh, we have sworn to uphold our Constitution of the United States of America, regardless of which committee you uh, serve on. Yet, we are about to give our seal of approval to a bill that gives military authority, uh, or gives the military the authority to hold American citizens captured abroad on suspicion of terrorism and to hold them indefinitely without trial. This is a codification of an unfortunate Supreme Court ruling that is wrong, and it gives that ruling statutory legitimacy. Mr. Speaker, we must reject indefinite detention of Americans and defend the Constitution. An American arrested abroad could be subject to uh, indefinite detention abroad, and that's wrong. No matter how you spin it, it's wrong. It's unjust, it's Orwellian, and it's not who we are. As Americans, we don't put Americans in jail indefinitely, without trial, no matter how heinous the accusations against them. This is not what we are about. This is not who we are. It's against our values as Americans, and for this reason I cannot support the bill. The bill also makes the military, not civilian law enforcement authorities, responsible for custody and prosecution in the military courts of, of foreign terrorist suspects apprehended within the United States. This provision disrespects and demoralizes our law enforcement officers and prosecutors who are responsible for protecting our national security using the United States criminal justice system and process, uh, which has been effectively used repeatedly to investigate, arrest, prosecute, and incarcerate for, <coughs> for long stints individuals uh, who are convicted of uh, terrorism. Imagine you an FBI agent or a federal prosecutor with a tremendous record finding, arresting, convicting, and locking up terrorists. Now you're told to step aside so that the military can do your job for you. The military is a machine of war, not a law enforcement agency. Uh, when Thank you. Schnellmanner. Thank you. That's why the Director of National Intelligence, the Director of the FBI, the Director of the CIA, the Head of the Justice Department's National Security Division, and the Secretary of Defense himself opposed this provision. More than 400 terrorists have been uh, convicted in our civilian courts. Only a handful of cases have been brought before military tribunals, and not all, all of them have been uh, uh, successful. 
If it ain't broke, ladies and gentlemen, don't fix it. Terrorism is a crime, and our law enforcement authorities, our prosecutors, our judges are more than up to the task. This bill ties the hands of law enforcement, militarizes counterterrorism on our own soil, and makes us less safe. Mr. Speaker, our constituents sent us here to provide for the common defense, yes, but they also sent us here to safeguard their liberty. So I ask my colleagues to think long and hard about this vote. And I ask the staffers watching this on C-SPAN to think long and hard before making their recommendations, reject indefinite detention, empower civilian law enforcement, and defend the Constitution. I yield back. For what purpose does the gentleman from California rise? Mr. Speaker, at this time I yield two minutes to my friend and colleague, the gentleman from Missouri, the chairman of the subcommittee on Sea Power and Protection Forces, and member of the conference committee, Mr. Aiken. The gentleman from Missouri is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, think that perhaps before we give the report on the status of sea power, I would make the comment that if this sequestration goes through, which people are talking about, it gravely influences the ability of our country to protect itself and um, it hollows out our force. As it is, if that were to go through, we would have the smallest navy or a navy smaller than we had in the year 1916. However, this particular authorization bill has some uh, good aspects. One of the things is it does support the construction of 10 new ships uh, in the uh, budget request. The bill also is going to um, require a competitive um, acquisition strategy for the main engine of the next generation bomber. Uh, that's a place we've gotten in trouble before. Uh, it allows the retirement of six B-1 aircraft, but still maintains the requirement for 36 aircraft uh, for the next two years. It provides the, uh, the uh, recommended force from the Air Force of the strategic airlift of 301 aircraft uh, comprised of C-17s and C-5s. It also requires the GAO to conduct an annual review on the new tanker program uh, which uh, the uh, military has just entered into. Uh, I would uh, be remiss if I didn't call our attention to a historic pattern that has occurred all through America's past, and that is in times of peace we keep cutting defense and cutting defense and then some uh, war comes up and then we don't have what we need and we sacrifice a lot of lives and money uh, and we also give ourselves fewer political possibilities uh, because we are not prepared. We are rapidly approaching that same mistake once again in our history with the danger of the sequestration. We've already taken almost a 10% cut in defense, uh, $450 billion. As a, mil as a Navy guy, what that means is 45 aircraft carriers. That's how much we've cut. The equivalent, we only have 11 in the Navy. You're not supposed to lose them or sink them. This would be the equivalent of cutting 45 aircraft carriers. That's before sequestration. We must be careful. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Expired. Gentleman from Washington. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I yield two minutes uh, to the gentlelady from California, the ranking member of the Personnel Subcommittee, Ms. Davis. Thank gentlelady you. from California is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today in support of the National Defense Authorization Act of 2012. As the ranking member of the Military Personnel Subcommittee, I am pleased that this bill includes a number of provisions that continues our commitment to our men and women in uniform as well as their dedicated families. First, I want to thank my chairman, Joe Wilson, for his support and assistance, and I would also like to recognize Chairman McKeon and Ranking Member Smith for their leadership. And I urge my colleagues to vote for this conference report as it supports our military and their families who have faced the stress and the strains of the decade at war. The conference report includes a 1.6 percent pay raise for our troops. And it will also require the Department of Defense to enhance suicide prevention programs and allow service members to designate any individual, regardless of their relationship, to direct how their remains are treated. This bill will also allow service secretaries to permit members to participate in an apprenticeship program that provides employment skills training. And it makes significant enhancements to the sexual assault and harassment policies of the DOD, such as requiring full-time sexual assault coordinators and victim advocates, ensuring access to legal assistance and allowing for the consideration of a permanent change of station, 
And finally, H.R. 1540 will ensure future TRICARE prime enrollment fees are tied to increases in military retired pay cost of living adjustments. The bill before us continues to recognize the sacrifices of those who serve our nation in uniform. I urge my colleagues to support this bill, and I yield back the balance of my time. The gentlelady yields back the balance for time. A gentleman from New York. Mr. Speaker, I now uh, yield uh, two minutes to the uh, distinguished uh, gentlelady from uh, Guam. The gentlelady from Guam is recognized for two minutes. I wish to uh, thank the ranking member, Mr. Smith, for his support for Guam and the gentleman from New York, Mr. Nadler. Mr. Speaker, I rise in strong opposition to H.R. 1540, the conference report accompanying the National Defense Authorization Act for fiscal year 2012. If I were able to vote on final passage of this legislation, I would vote against this bill. The bill completely ignores the important efforts that this administration has taken to better posture our military forces in the Pacific. Furthermore, we undercut efforts, significant efforts, by Prime Minister Noda in Japan in trying to achieve progress with the development of the Futenma replacement facility. I am deeply concerned about this bill because there are constant talk in this chamber about recognizing the importance of the Asia-Pacific region. And now we are going in the opposite direction. People discuss their concerns about the potential threats posed by both China and North Korea. Yet, when this country and this administration ask the Congress to act in our best national interest to realign forces in the Pacific, we blink. We are all talk and no action on this very important issue. I understand the budget realities that we currently face, but we must make the necessary hard choices and investments now, or it will cost more money and time in the long run. That said, it is important for our partners in Japan to continue the progress they are making to begin construction of a replacement facility for Futenma in northern Okinawa. It is important for Prime Minister Noda to continue to show leadership and present an environmental impact statement to the Governor of Okinawa by the end of this year. Further, we must have further progress toward the permitting of a landfill so that we can finally move forward with this realignment. Right or wrong, the patience of those in the Senate has run out, and it is important for more action and less rhetoric in Okinawa. I ask the gentleman if I could have an extra 30 seconds. Uh, the gentlelady has yielded an additional 30 seconds. The gentlelady is recognized for 30 additional seconds. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The cuts to infrastructure funding on Guam are simply punitive, and they fly in the face of unified action by both the House and Senate appropriators. This Congress has uniformly stated that infrastructure improvements are needed on Guam to sustain any type of additional military presence. Yet, once again, our rhetoric does not match our words. I will continue to work to make sure that we get funding to address critical infrastructure needs. And as such, I urge all my colleagues to vote no on this legislation. The time of the gentlelady has expired. The gentleman from California. Mr. Speaker, uh, I yield myself one minute to engage in a colloquy with my friend from uh, Louisiana, Mr. Landry. The gentleman is recognized for one minute. Uh, the NDAA conference report, uh, Mr. Landry. Yeah. Did, oh. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, I rise today in order to fulfill my constitutional duty of protecting the liberty and freedom that the men and women who this bill authorizes to fight for are protected, and that the protection is bestowed on U.S. citizens are the ones that I am concerned the most. The question that upon us is whether or not the NDA impacts the right of a U.S. citizen to receive due process to challenge the legality of detention by the executive before an Article III court. This conference report does no such thing. It in no, it no way affects the rights of U.S. citizens. My concern is that when the writ is suspended, the government is entirely free of judicial oversight. So we agree that no section of the NDA purports to suspend the writ of habeas corpus. I agree completely. And do you agree that the Supreme Court has held 
that quote the, the state that during a state of war is not a blank check for the president when it comes to the rights of our citizens. I do. Will you assure me that you will work with... Additional 15 seconds. Additional 15 seconds, gentlemen. Will you assure me that together we can work with the committee to further clarify the language contained in this bill in order to ensure that clear and precise language which protects Amer American citizens' constitutional rights are protected. I do, and I'll be happy to work with you at that end. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman's time has expired. A gentleman from Washington. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. At this point, yield one minute to the gentlelady from Massachusetts, Ms. Songus. The gentleman yields one minute to the gentlelady from Massachusetts. Mr. Speaker, I rise in support of the National Defense Authorization Act that is before us today. I want to thank Chairman McKeon, Ranking Member Smith, and all the members of the Armed Services Committee who have worked to ensure that significant protections for our service members are included in this year's bill, particularly for those who are survivors of uh, military sexual trauma. I also want to highlight inclusion of a long-term reauthorization of the Small Business Innovation Research Program. It is the government's most effective research and development program, creating jobs and fostering innovation in Massachusetts and across the country. And it plays a critical role for the Department of Defense. The bill before us today ensures that the SBIR program retains its proper focus on true small businesses, creating a platform for needed job growth while guaranteeing that our armed forces continue to have access to the best technology available. And I urge, pass urge passage. Thank you, and I yield back my time. The gentlelady yields back the balance for time. The gentleman from New York. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I reserve at this time. Gentleman reserves. A gentleman from California. Yeah, but I'm fucked. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I yield that two minutes to my friend and colleague, the gentleman from South Carolina, the chairman of the subcommittee on military personnel, Mr. Wilson. Gentleman from South Carolina is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Chairman McKeon, for your commitment to military service members, family members, and veterans. Before I begin, I want to commend Vice Chairman Mac Thornberry for his clarification of the detainee issue, and that is that the issue does not apply to U.S. citizens. This is directed at al-Qaeda, illegal enemy combatants, not at U.S. citizens. The military personnel provisions of the H.R. 1540 provide new and important authorities to support the men and women in uniform and their families. Some of the more important personnel provisions contained in the conference agreement are a 1.6 percent increase in military basic pay, a revised policy for measuring and reporting unit operations tempo and personnel tempo, especially when we must continue our resolve for victory in the current mission requirements. Another initiative important to my constituents is reform of the military recruiting system to include graduates of homeschooling and virtual schools. I see military service as opportunity and fulfilling, and these are extraordinary patriots who deserve the opportunity to serve. The conference agreement would make the chief of the National Guard Bureau a member of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Furthermore, the agreement clarifies the legal authority for oversight of Arlington National Cemetery, a national shrine for veterans. I believe this bill also is strong in the multiple, multiple provisions dealing with sexual assault and provides new authority, such as temporary early retirement, to ease the impact of future military personnel reductions. I urge all my colleagues to support the conference report. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I yield the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back the balance of time. Gentleman from Washington. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. May I first inquire as to how much time each person has left? Gentleman from Washington has 10 minutes. Ten. The gentleman from California, Mr. McKeon, eight and one quarter. New York has four additional minutes remaining. Great. Thank you. With that, I uh, yield two minutes uh, to the gentleman from Rhode Island, Mr. Langevin. The gentleman yields two minutes to the gentlewoman, the gentleman from uh, I'm Rhode sorry, Island. I'm ra sorry. Ranking member on the Emerging Threat Subcommittee. Without uh, objection. So ordered. Thank the gentleman for yielding. Mr. Speaker, I rise today in support of H.R. 1540, the 2012 National Defense Authorization Act. 
And I'd like to begin by thanking Chairman McKeon and Ranking Member Smith and my subcommittee chairman, uh, Mr. Thornberry, for their leadership and commitment to keeping our nation safe uh, and protecting our service members. As a conferee, I was certainly proud to join them in signing the conference report Monday night, and I'm even more proud of our excellent staff that uh, completed a full conference in a record one week's time. As ranking member of the Emerging Threats Subcommittee, I I'm especially pleased with the inclusion of significant funding for Special Operations Forces, the full reauthorization of the SBIR program, uh, and support, uh, uh, to support our job creating small businesses and uh, also the inclusion of important cyber protections to prevent future incidents similar to WikiLeaks. This bill also ensures the long-term strength of programs critical to our naval dominance and strategic posture, such as the purchase of two Virginia-class submarines, also fully funding the development of the Ohio replacement submarine, and continuing work on the first Zumwalt DDG-1000 destroyer. Further, the conference committee successfully removed damaging language that would have ended efforts by DOD to procure clean alternative fuel technology in order to break our dependence on foreign oil and reduce our carbon footprint, which DOD officials uh, have uh, stated are both uh, high risk to our national security. Finally, while I'm concerned that we were unable to uh, uh, remove some harmful measures requiring that terrorist detainees be held in military custody, provisions included in this bill help address concerns about the potential detention of U.S. citizens in military custody and the flexibility of counterterrorism efforts, uh, efforts by the FBI. In closing, this legislation supports the incredible sacrifices of our brave men and women in uniform who make, uh, that they make for our country every day and provides critical resources to carry out our vital national security projects. With that, uh, I've been proud of uh, the serve on the House Armed Services Committee and to serve uh, with uh, Chairman McCann and Ranking Member Smith, and I commend them and the, uh, for the great work that they have done. I'm producing a, uh, a, a good bill, and, uh, and I appreciate the staff for their great work as well. With that, I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman's time has expired. Well, without objection, the gentleman from Virginia will control the time of the gentleman from California. Mr. Speaker, I reserve the, the balance Virginia's of my time. Recognized. Mr. Mr. Speaker, I reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman reserves the balance his time. The gentleman from New York. Uh, isn't it the turn of the gentleman from uh, Washington? Uh, the last uh, speaker was. Uh, oh well, I'll, I'll reserve it this time. I'll Washington. reserve it this time. The gentleman reserves. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I yield two minutes to my friend and colleague, the gentleman from Ohio, the chairman of the Subcommittee on Strategic Forces and member of the Conference Committee, Mr. Turner. The gentleman from Ohio is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I join my colleagues in speaking in favor of passage of the conference report on the FY12 NDAA. As chairman of the Strategic Forces Subcommittee, I'd like to walk through some of the key provisions of the conference report. This conference report imposes checks on the administration's plans for nuclear reductions by requiring assessment of those reductions from the STRATCOM commander before any nuclear weapons reductions are made. It also requires the administration to disclose its plans for future reductions and reasserts congressional oversight of the nation's nuclear war plan. Concerning the proposed light squared network, we have retained House and Senate provisions that will ensure that the FCC will not be able to give final approval to that network unless it resolves concerns about impacts to our national security. Recent press reports indicate that per new test results, light squares proposed network continues to create unacceptable interference to DOD's GPS systems. I would also like to thank Chairman Hal Rogers and Chairman Rodney Freelheisen for the support of the NNSA vital nuclear weapons programs. Now, I'd also like to discuss an issue that is important to our men and women in uniform, impacts our Air Force's readiness, and forces service members to choose between their service to their nation and their families. This is the issue of military child custody. A short time after becoming a member of the House Armed Services Committee, I was struck to learn that this country's judicial system was using a service member's deployment against them when making child custody determinations. Just to be clear, we're asking an all-volunteer force, which consists of less than 1% of our population, to engage in the longest conflict in our nation's history, endure more deployments than any other generation in our history, and do so at the peril of losing custody of their children upon return. 
Recognizing this unconscionable injustice, the House Armed Services Committee has included language in the past five National Defense Authorization Acts to provide service members with a uniform standard of protection. This provision has also made it through the House Veteran Affairs Committee. Unfortunately, despite overwhelming bipartisan support in the House and the support for the Department of Defense, the Senate has once again failed our service members and their families. It appears that they are operating on false information. This provision should pass the House, and we're going to continue to, to stand Gentlemen's for our service time members. Expired. Thank you. Gentleman from Washington. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. At this time, I'm pleased to yield one and a half minutes to the gentlelady from Texas, Ms. Jackson Lee. <laughs> General, the gentlelady from Texas is recognized for one and a half minutes. I thank the uh, ranking member and I uh, thank uh, the members of this committee. This is a very tough decision. But in the midst of welcoming home uh, many of our troops, I believe it is important to look at aspects of this legislation that has been uh, corrected and aspects that have been enhanced. Let me thank the members of the committee for the enhancement of the small business technology uh, and uh, the efforts on research and development. Let me thank them for the response to sexual assault and harassment policies that have been improved uh, as well as the improvement of the military pay for our military families and soldiers uh, and the enhanced resources that have been put uh, in helping our soldiers return to the workplace. Uh, but I am uh, concerned, and as I've reviewed this, uh, let me specifically yield to the gentleman, uh, the ranking member, uh, and ask the question on detention, which I think so many are concerned. Uh, it is my understanding that, uh, along with present law, uh, that this has been vetted, uh, the language of detention and the uh, response to civilians, American civilians and legal aliens, been vetted to be in sync with the Constitution due process and the right to habeas corpus uh, if uh, individuals are detained. Yes, uh, and we absolutely protect those rights. And I believe also that Congress